So, we're in chapter 4 tonight, we're going to finish 4 and 5, and we're looking at heaven. Hey, Lauren, you just started. You're right on time. Testing, testing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so far that we've seen that heaven is a little bit different than what maybe some of us have been accustomed to seeing, especially if, you know, on TV and other places where heaven is depicted as this tranquil place with waterfalls and rainbows and little cherubs flying around and you're sitting on a cloud somewhere playing a harp. Unicorns. <laughs> Unicorns. <laughs> uh, streets of gold and you know, St. Peter at the Golden Gates and all of that, right? But actually what we're going to see, and we are seeing, is that heaven is a rather bizarre place. There's some really strange stuff up there. And so far we have seen that God depicted as just a wash in color and brilliant light and just, you know, just beautiful and wonderful. And, and uh, we're going to see now that um, there's a lot of strange creatures up there. And tonight, uh, starting in verse 4, we're going to see that heaven is where the redeemed saints dwell. That's kind of an obvious thing, right? Well, they're represented there in verse 4. It says, and around the throne of God were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. Now that's verse 4. Now, not only do we see God in heaven, but God is surrounded by 24 elders. Now, who are these elders? You know, we have to ask ourselves, what, what, is, what are these? The word elder actually is the word presbyteros. It's the word that we get our word Presbyterian from. Uh, a young girl went, came home from, from church and her mom asked her, you know, how was Sunday school? And she said, oh, it was great. She said, well, what did you learn in Sunday school? She said, well, we're studying Revelation. Hi, guys. Have a seat. We just got started. So the mom said, oh, Revelation, huh? She said, yeah. I said, well, what did you learn about it? She said, well, we learned that there's only going to be 24 Presbyterians in heaven. <laughs> well, kind of got it right. The Bible says there's 24 elders or 24, 24 Presbyteros. That's... That. Who are these people? Who are these elders sitting around the throne? Well, there are some things that are told here that might help identify these 24 elders. First of all, they're called elders. Well, who has elders? elders. Who? Presbyterians. Presbyterians have elders. They do. That's why they're called Presbyterians. Uh, the church has elders, right? We all have elders. They're elder. elder we all... You know, we're always told, you know, obey your elders, you know. But in this context, we're seeing a representation of something. So this is a representation, and they're called elders, presbyteros, which is also a term that we get our word bishop from. So these are leaders of some type. And it says that they were sitting on thrones. Now, who's going to be sitting on, who sits on thrones? Who? Jesus? Kings. Oh, kings, I'm sorry. Kings, yes, kings sit on throne. People who rule. Okay, uh, 12 different tribes in the Old Testament, yeah. Um, so, people that sit on thrones are people that rule, people who are kings. Interesting, we are told in 2 Timothy that if we endure, we shall also reign with him. So, this might be referring to this um, verse here, where it's talking about our reward in heaven. We're going to reign and rule with Christ. So maybe it has something to do with us. Now, the number 24 is kind of interesting. Not only are these 24 elders sitting on thrones, but there's 24 of them. Now, that's an interesting number. Whenever you get a number given to you in the scripture, it's significant of something. So 24, okay, what is that? Well, that's 2 times 12, or it's... Four times six, or, you know, how, how do we parse this, right? Well, let's, let's take 24 and divide it into 12, all right? I think that would probably be the easiest thing to do. We've got 12 and 12. So, what are there 12 of in the Bible? You mentioned 12 tribes of Israel, right? Oh, the 12 apostles, right? 
Um, interestingly enough, because these people are sitting on thrones, and there's 12 of them, they might be representative in some way of the church, as represented by the apostles. We, well, because we're trying to identify who these elders are. Okay. And the number is significant. And so if we take 24, can we think of anything in the Bible that corresponds to a 24? Which one? I, I don't know any 24. Numbers are significant in the Bible. We can divide it by four sixes, but I don't know of anything that's four sixes. But if I divide it by 2, and now I've got 12 and 12, now I'm starting to get some association. There's 12 apostles. And that would be the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there were 12 judges. There were 12 tribes of Israel. But apparently we're talking about, because they're sitting on thrones, people who are, in a sense, have some authority to rule. Well, the 12 tribes really don't have authority authority like that, but the judges in the Old Testament did. The judges were those who ruled over the Old Testament um, nation of Israel. And there were 12 of them, which is kind of interesting. Well, we're just kind of speculating here. We have thrones, we have elders, we have 24 of them. What else can we know about them? Notice what it says, they were clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their head. All right, a little bit more um, clues as to who these 24 elders are. Who has white robes? Well, we know Jesus had a, had a white robe. When he comes back, he's got a white robe. But the fact that they have crowns of gold helps us, I think, to identify these 24 elders. White robes are given to those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's right, that's me and you. That's, that's Revelation 7, 14. And crowns are rewards. 2 Timothy 4, 8 tells us that we will receive a crown. And so we also cast our crowns before the Lord in heaven when we're there. So we can see a little bit more about these 24 elders. Who are they? Well, I believe what we're seeing are the representatives of the redeemed both Old and New Testament, in heaven. When God is painting his picture of heaven for us in the book of Revelation, he's giving us representations of what's there. We're all going to be there. But here we're represented by the 24 elders. Notice what it says in Revelation 5. What's that? Sorry. Aren't they called the church age saints? Yeah. Yeah, we're called saints. But Paul told Timothy in all the churches appoint elders to represent the churches. And so we're seeing a representation of all the redeemed, both Old and New Testament here in heaven. Why are there only 12? Why are there only 24? Well, because I think, and I'm just guessing, but because of the symbolism we're looking at here, God is giving us or painting a picture of what is in heaven, or who is in heaven. And because these 24 elders are representative of redeemed Old and New Testament saints, we're seeing that heaven is the place where we will dwell forever. God is painting that picture for us. He could have said, and there were thousands and millions and millions of people redeemed, and that would have been easier for us to understand, I suppose, but he doesn't do it that way. And then the fact that they're in white robes. Notice what Revelation 5 later on tells us. It says, they sang a new song, they being the elders. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So really, I kind of think this sort of confirms for us what we're looking at here when we're talking about the 24 elders around the throne of God. They are representative of the redeemed of the earth who have been washed clean by the blood of Christ as a symbolism of all of us that are going to be there. And notice what else it says. It says, heaven is a place of awesome energy. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
Now when he says thunders and lightnings and voices, that usually speaks of God's righteous rule. Um, Exodus, remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and God met them at Mount Sinai? And what did they see when God appeared on the mountain to talk to Moses? The children of Israel saw thunders and lightnings, so much so that they were completely terrified and wanted to back away and said, you go up and talk to God. I don't want to talk to God. You, know, you talk to God for us, because they were terrified. That's because of the awesome energy that emanates from the throne of God. And we saw before that the seven spirits of God was the sevenfold manifestation of the spirit of God, not seven individual spirits, but the Holy Spirit as represented in the seven attributes of his deity. And we see that from Isaiah 11 too. We won't go there because I'm trying to move quickly at this point. So anyway, not only is it a place of immense energy, it's also a place of God's holiness. Look at verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. So now John is seeing the throne. He's seeing the 24 elders around the throne. He's seeing all this energy and lightning and colors and flashes and, and uh, beauty and all this. And then before the throne, he sees this big giant sea of glass like crystal. Just smooth and clear and beautiful. Well, what is that about? Well, in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, what did the sea represent to the people? Like the Mediterranean Sea or any of the large bodies of ocean. Well, it represented a barrier that needed to be crossed. It represented a place of separation between them and whatever was on the other side of the ocean. And whenever anyone ventured out into the ocean or into the sea, they were taking their own life into their hands because it was a, it was a separation from what they wanted to get to. And it was a dangerous place. But notice this glass of sea is smooth like crystal. And although it speaks of separation between God and all his creation, because God is holy, God is righteous, God is separate from us. We, are, we approach God through cleansing. Because one of the things in the Old Testament temple was a a sea of water. It wasn't a big sea, but it was a big giant body of water. It was a laver of water, and they called it, um, I forget what they called it, but the purpose of it was for cleansing. See, this water that was at the temple was a ceremonial cleansing of the people that caused them to be allowed to come close to God. Whenever the people came to the temple, they always had to go through a baptism. I don't know if you know this. It was called a mishpah. But if you came to the temple to, in order to worship God, you had to first go into this bath of water and be cleansed. And it was a symbolic gesture to tell us that we needed to be cleansed in order to approach a holy God. So we see our holy God on the other side of this marvelous sea of glass that was like crystal. Notice 1 Timothy 6.16. He says, Who alone, that's God, has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. So we're seeing that symbolize that, that, that attribute of God. And notice what else is in heaven. It's a place of magnificent creatures. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man. The fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. Now, I think that we would probably be rather terrified if we saw something like that outside our kitchen window. They're pretty scary creatures. Who are they? What are they? Anybody have any guesses? What do you think these creatures are? Angels? Yeah, probably got something that we would describe as an angel. Not the pretty little floaty angels that come around with the pretty hair that we stick on top of our Christmas tree. No one would want to put these guys up there, right? But yeah, they're probably 
God's created creatures. God's created intelligences. You see, God has all kinds of creatures up there. Not just beautiful angels with long hair and wings. He's got these guys up there. He also has other cherubims and seraphim and all these other uh, animals. And not animals, they're creatures that he created, but they're all around the throne of God. And these are God's intelligent creations that serve him before his throne. Their purpose is to worship and serve the Creator God. That's their whole purpose, is to worship God. They were created just for that purpose. And the reason they're so strange, some have connected these four um, creatures to the four classes of God's creations, such as a lion and a calf and a man and an eagle. A lion would represent wild animals, where calves would represent domestic animals, and man, humans, and eagles, flying animals. Notice there's no birds. I mean, there's no fish, right? There's just domestic and wild land animals. Some have said, well, that's because there's no sea in the new, new heaven and new earth. When you get to the end of Revelation, God creates a new heaven and a new earth, and there's no sea there. Others have liked them to the four Gospels. Jesus came as a lion or a king in Matthew. He came as a sacrifice for the world, which would be represented by the calf. In Luke, he came as the son of man. I'm sorry, in Mark, he came as the son of man. And John, he came as the son of God, which would be represented by an eagle. We don't really know. It's just these are four creatures up there, and, and God gives them to us in a very unusual appearance. And they are representative of the living creatures that serve before God, angelic creatures. And notice what else about heaven. It's a place of continual worship. You know, some, someone has said, if you don't enjoy worshiping God here on earth, you're not going to like heaven. Because that's all we do. We don't do much other than worship God most of the time. And he says, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes round and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That is their job, day and night, continually. Now, this probably confirms the identity of these living creatures as the seraphim that we read about in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah tells us, if you want to go there at some point uh, in your own personal reading, he tells us about a vision he sees of God where he sees seraphim. These seraphim were angels that had six wings, and they did the same thing. They cried, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth, is, are, filled, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. So we see these angelic creatures. So we have representatives of heaven, uh, the redeemed up there. We have the representatives of God's created intelligences up there. And it says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him forever and ever and casts their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So the fact that the living creatures do not rest day or night in giving praise and worship means that praise and worship is the continual activity of heaven by not only the angels, but by the redeemed. You and I, when we get there, that's going to be what we'll be doing. What, what is the emphasis of their praise and worship? What are they praising God for here? He created all things. Because he's the creator. Yes, because he created everything. Because he is to receive power and glory because by... His will and for His purposes, they exist. A lot of people say, you know, they ask him, why did God create everything? Why did God do what He did? Why did God create Satan? Why did God let man fall and sin? Why did God have to send Jesus to the cross? And You know, we, we always ask, why did God do this? Why does God do that? Because He wanted to. Because He wants to. That's pretty much the reason. For by your will, they exist. He does what he does because he's God and he wants to do it that way. Not everybody likes that. You, know? I don't. <laughs> you don't like that. <laughs> no, I, I really, I have a 
real problem with that. I don't believe God would want people to be on their knees worshiping 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and have no thought or purpose in their life other than being on their knees worshiping him. That is an egotistical way of looking at things. And I don't think God believes egotism. I well, that part of well, that may be that may be a good statement. We don't understand that part of it. It does say that's what we'll be doing. We can't deny that's what the words are saying. We may not like it, and we may not understand it. And I don't think that's all we're going to be doing. Yeah. But I think it'll be the major part of what we're doing. Because it says also in the Bible that he's going to be here. Everybody is going to have a house. He's preparing mm -hmm. a house. Yeah, we're going to have a mansion. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the major activity of heaven is going to be worshiping because it says the living creatures give glory. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the, to the, to the God who's on the throne, and we just read they do this day and night. It says that 24 elders fall down, they worship him, they cast their crowns. That's representative of us. So pretty much it's a continual activity of heaven. But I, I take a little more literal approach. If God says something, I think he means it. When he says here <clears throat> that whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, the 24 elders fall down before him and worship him who lives forever. I kind of think that's what it's going to be. Now, I think there's other things going on, but I think the majority of our, of our activity will be to worship him and to fall down before him and cast our crowns at his feet, saying, you are worthy. We see this refrain a few more times in the book of Revelation. And this is something that people like Jackie and others say, you know, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. <clears throat> I'm not sure that's what I want to do for the rest of eternity. It really gets to the heart of why are you doing what you're doing as a believer? Why are you even a believer? What is it that has drawn you to the place where you received Christ as your Savior? And really, the, at the heart and the core of all we do is to bring glory to God and to worship Him. If that isn't what you're doing, what you're doing for, then I would say that you might want to look at your life a little bit and make sure that it's not for your own glory or for some other reason. Because what we do, we should be doing for the glory of God. Because in heaven, everything that happens is for his glory and for his honor, because he is worthy. All right, so let's move on. Chapter 5. So now John sees another... Oops, here we go. Chapter 5. So now John sees that the Lamb is worthy to open this book that is going to unfold the events of the last seven years on the earth. In verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. All right, so John is seeing the throne of God. He sees God on the throne, and he sees in the right hand of God a scroll. Now, in that day, the way they wrote their books wasn't like our books. They had a scroll or a piece of parchment that was laid out, and they rolled it, and they wrote on it, and then they would roll it up. If you've ever seen um, video of, of rabbis reading from the Old Testament, a lot of times they'll have a scroll, and they'll be rolling one end and unrolling the other as they read it. Well, that's how they wrote in the Old Testament days. It was on scrolls. And so God has in this hand a scroll. Well, what is this scroll? Well, it's the events that are going to unfold on the earth that we're going to read about in the book of Revelation. And it says it was sealed with seven seals. So what this book really is, is the title deed for the earth. Because Jesus is going to take back what Adam lost in the old in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they had dominion over all the earth. They lost that when they sinned. And Satan became the prince of the power of the air. 
up until the time they sinned, Adam and Eve ruled God's creation under God's control and command. Remember, God told them, go into the garden and take care of it. I want you to have dominion over all the fish of the sea and the fowl, the fowl of the air. Adam had dominion. He lost that. And sin came into the world. And God is going to take it back. And this book that's in his hand, this scroll, is the deed to this earth's dominion. It outlines, God, it outlines God's program for the final overthrow of man's rebellion. You know, in the, old, in the Roman law, a will had to be sealed seven times in order for uh, it to be a legal document. A Roman will. He rolled it up, talked about what... Um, the owner of the will wanted, and it had to be sealed with seven seals. Very reminiscent of this. This is God's will, his deed to the earth. And it says in verse 2, who is, worthy to op who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. Why do you think this scene affected John so deeply that it would cause him to weep much? Just overflowing with emotion here. Why? What was so dramatic about this? Well, he didn't evidently feel he was worthy to open the seal. Okay, so it might have been a personal remorse that he wasn't in the crowd that had been deemed worthy to open this. That's possible. It's possible. Anybody else have any thoughts? He, was no he might have just been sad because there was no one that could open it. You know, he wanted to know what it was. He he probably was thinking of about Daniel chapter seven here. Daniel chapter 7 is a very similar passage as to the one we're seeing here. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel received a vision of God on the throne. And the dominion for the world was given to the Son of Man. As Daniel sees this vision unfold, if you remember when we went through Daniel, well, let's just go there because it's very important comparison here. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel saw a vision of God. And starting in verse 9, he says, And as I looked, thrones were set, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, his wheels were all ablaze, a river of fire was flowing coming out from behind him. Thousands of thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 before him stood. The court was seated. The books were opened. That's a pretty impressive vision of God. <clears throat> and then he sees, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Now, who is this one like the Son of Man, do you think? That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. He had often referred to himself as the Son of Man. That's why the Pharisees were so angry at him, because he was claiming to be this one being referenced in Daniel. But notice why this Son of Man comes to the presence of God. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Daniel is seeing a vision of the coming Son of Man who was going to take back dominion of this earth from Satan. And now the time has come in the book of Revelation, as he is seeing this vision unfold before him, and he's expecting who to step forward and take the scroll? The Son of Man. Daniel just said that's what was going to happen. So John is seeing this vision unfold in Revelation, and who steps forth? Nobody yet. No one in heaven, on earth, and under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. <clears throat> 
He's like, what? Come on. That's not what Daniel told me. That's not what we were expecting. And maybe he was overcome because maybe he thought just for a moment that maybe the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't the one, you know, or maybe there was a problem here. Maybe he didn't fulfill everything God wanted him to do. We don't know. He doesn't tell us. But I think he was certainly surprised when no one was found worthy to open the book. Because the one person that should have been worthy to open the book, he had worshipped and followed on this earth for three years and was expecting to step forward, and yet that didn't happen. And I'm pretty sure that's probably why he was upset. But not for long. One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now, it's interesting to me that it's an elder that comes forward to proclaim to John, there is one. Do not weep. Why do you think it would be an elder instead of an angel or some other created creature? Elders, remember, represent the redeemed on the earth. Somebody in that 24 elder group comes forward and said, don't worry, we have someone. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why an elder? Because he was what? Okay, he had some authority. All right. Angels have authority. There could have been an angel that did it, but God chose an elder to step forward to do that. It might be because he had the authority to do it. I think, personally, it's because he is more closely identified with John, and the one who comes forth is the one who has redeemed all of man. And so, God allows an elder to step forth, and that elder represents the redeemed of the world. And so, because of God's redemption, that's why Christ is allowed and is worthy to open the book. So, it's an elder that tells John, do not weep. Why is Jesus called the Lion of the tribe of Judah? He is identified as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse. He has prevailed to open the book. Why is he called the Lion of the tribe of Judah? We often refer to him that way, right? Because why? He's strongest, okay. Lions are strong, right? Yeah, lions are very strong. Noble. Hmm? Noble. Noble, they're noble. That's awfully, that's true too. Lions are strong. Lions are noble. It was what? Who? Okay, he comes from the tribe of Judah. That's a very good point. In fact, in the Old Testament in Genesis, um, he's referred to as that. In fact, let's look at Genesis 49. Genesis 49. This is a prophecy by Jacob who blesses his children. And when he comes to Judah to bless him, here's what he says to Judah. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son, like a lion, he crouches and lies down, like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah. What's a scepter? It's like a king's crown, right? The king's crown will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. This is a prophecy, a reference to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is coming to rule and to reign. So when Jesus is referred to as the Lion of Judah, he's actually being referred to in fulfillment of this prophecy, that Jesus is coming to rule and to reign on this earth. And he's called the Root of Jesse, because it was from David that he was brought into this world manifest in the flesh. 
So there's significance to these terms being used because he has prevailed, he has fulfilled what God has required. And it says in verses 6 and 7, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So now Jesus is depicted here as a lamb. First he was depicted as the lion of Judah, but now as a lamb. Why is he depicted as a lamb? Because he was slain for us. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the emphasis upon why he's worthy to receive this scroll, because notice he takes it out of the hand of God. He's going to open it up and unroll all of the things that are going to transpire on the earth. And he is worthy because he laid down his life for us. And I believe this to be one of the most important chapters in the book. Why the Lord Jesus is worthy. Because that is what it says. As the lion, he is the only one capable of executing God's judgment on sin. While at the same time, fully demonstrating in his person God's unsurpassed love for sinful man as the lamb. That's quite a combination there. The Bible says that judgment is God's strange work. Over and over again, we read that God is slow to anger and full of mercy. We are told that God is not willing that any should perish. And God weeps over the rebellion of his people. And in Zechariah, God pleads with his people to turn to him. But in the end, God cannot ignore sin. It must be judged. And it was in the body of the Lord Jesus. And the reason the Lord Jesus is worthy to open the seals is because as bad as God's wrath will be on the earth, it will not equal the suffering the Lord Jesus endured as God's judgment was poured out upon him for the sin of the world. Hell's fury was unleashed on him and the wrath of Almighty God for our iniquity was placed on him. And so he and he alone, because he alone endured the cross and despising the shame, is worthy. And so we see that being depicted here in him as the lion and as the lamb. <clears throat> and so what is the result of all of this? Well, we're going to see again the worship of the redeemed. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp. Oh, that's where that comes from. You know, we'll have harps in heaven. So the 24 elders, being representative of the redeemed of the earth, fell down before the Lord, having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed, to us, redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people, and have made us kings and priests to our gods, to our God, and we will reign on the earth. Now, this is the 24 elders worshiping God in heaven. So I think in these verses, we can see the confirmation that these representatives of the redeemed are the guardians of the prayers of the saints of God. And so they are representative of all of us. They take our prayers and are guardians of those prayers to God. And notice what it says. It says they sing a new song of redemption. Now, whenever I see something that says they sing something new, I always want to think, well, what was the old song? Did they have an old song? Or is this just a song that is new to them? Well, I kind of think they had an old song. And now they're singing a new song. It's just not me. Others have suggested this too. So what's the old song? Well, you know, if you do a, a concordance search in the Bible, just type in sing or type in song. Uh, you know what comes up first? It's the song of Moses. It's found in the book of Exodus, chapter 15. And it's a song of deliverance. When the Jews were brought out of Egypt, 
and they came across from the other side of the Red Sea. It says they sang the song of Moses, and it was a song glorifying God for his deliverance of them from the Egyptian. So could that be the old song that this new song is replacing? Uh, well, I don't think so, because Moses' song is actually mentioned again in the book of Revelation chapter 15. So it takes its position somewhere else. So what's the next song that is mentioned? Well, it's actually a song found in Deuteronomy 31. And this is an interesting song. I want to return to this song. Deuteronomy chapter 31. In verses 16 through 22. And the Lord said to Moses, You are going to rest with your ancestors, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to foreign gods of the land they are entering. That's not a cheery outlook for them, is it? They will forsake me and break the covenant that I made with them. And in that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and calamities will come on them. And in that day, they will ask, have not these disasters come on us because our God is not with us? So God is predicting to Moses what the children of Israel were going to do when they enter the land of Israel. They were going to disobey God. Did that come true? Yeah, it certainly did. And God says, and I will certainly hide my face in that day because of all their wickedness in turning to other gods. Now I write down this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. When I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on oath to their ancestors, and when they eat their fill and thrive, they will turn to other gods rejecting me. And when these disasters have come upon them, this song will testify against them because it is not to be forgotten by their descendants. Now, how would you like to have that song sung in church? Let's all sing the song of how we're going to fail miserably and we're all going to be punished and destroyed because of our rejection of God. Let's all sing together. Hey, clap your hands on that one. Yes. Not going to go over too big. But this was a song that Moses was supposed to teach the children of Israel. When they got in the land, they're supposed to teach to their children how you're going to be destroyed because you're all going to disobey God. No, they didn't, did they? <laughs> but they knew the song. So Moses wrote the song that day and taught it to the Israelites. Do you know the tune to that, Yeah, it would be in a minor key. Minor key. I think that's the old song. Because what's that song? That's the song of our failure. That's the song of the Israelites' failure. The song that, that um, they sang because God said, on your own power and on your own merit and trying to keep the law, you're going to fall flat on your face. And don't we do that when we try and do it our way? We certainly do. And that's our old song. But what's the new song? The new song is a song of redemption. The new song is replaced has replaced our old song. We have a song that reminds us of God's grace and God's forgiveness. And that's the song that they sing in heaven, not the song of the failure that we all face day to day as we try and live for God and we just fail Him. But God is still gracious. That's the wonderful thing. The problem is that many of us go through life singing that old song, you know, of failure and and. Failing to incorporate the grace and forgiveness offered to us every day. And many Christians live under the weight of past sins and failing to live in the new life of joy and victory that ours are in Christ. You know, we, we just do. Uh, I, I found this uh, quote, and I think it's a good one. It says, it is, a hymn, it is the hymn of Revelation 5 that expresses that the entire physical universe was created for God's glory but humanity rebelled and the universe fell under the weight of sin. That's our old song. That's the song Moses taught to the Jews. Yet the serpent's seduction of Adam and Eve did not catch God by surprise. He had in place a plan by which he would redeem mankind 
and all of creation from sin, corruption, and death. Just as he promises to make men and women new, he promises to renew the earth itself. How? By the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God. There is no other way. That's our new song. And that's the new song we should be singing and praising and pro proclaiming as they do in heaven. So notice now the end of this chapter um, ends with the worship of all creation before God's throne. Here we go again, right? And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. So here we see that Yes, in fact, what we're seeing with the creatures and the elders, these are representation of a greater number. And that greater number is so great that we can't even number it. When he says thousands and thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands and blah, 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 that means you can't, you, know, you can't number them. They're just innumerable. Angels and creatures and redeemed from the earth. And what are they doing? They're all saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. What a marvelous worship scene this is. So in closing, let's just talk about what this passage that we just read and the rest of it is teaching us. Well, first of all, it teaches us that God is Christ. Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Let's make no mistake about that. He is to be worshipped. He is, he is God. He is the creator of all things. He's the redeemer of all things. This chapter definitely tells us that. And the second thing it teaches us is that in Christ's blood is redemption for all who call upon the name of the Lord. It's by His blood that we're saved. Not by our works of righteousness, not because He's a good teacher, not because He showed us the way or you know any of the other garbage that the cults and the isms try and teach you. You stand before God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and that is the only reason we can stand before God. Number three, the church is called to proclaim the truth in word and deed. That's why he presents this to us. That our purpose is to worship God and to sing this new song of redemption and give people hope and give them a reason to look forward to the future. And number four, that all creation is created for one purpose and that's to worship the Lamb of God and the one who sits on the throne. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And that's what we're seeing in this picture. So that sets the stage for what is to follow, which is how God redeems the all of creation to himself and takes dominion of the earth. And that's what we'll start in chapter 6 when we get into the opening of the scrolls, of the scroll, uh, and into all the scary stuff. Okay, so questions, comments?